Good morning, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started here in the interest of time. Uh, welcome this morning to Grand Rounds. We have uh, three great topics that we're going to hear about today. So I'm just going to go ahead and introduce uh, all three of our speakers and then um, let them roll and we'll minimize interruption. So first we'll be hearing from our uh, uveitis fellow, Lynn Hassman. She's going to speak to us about an update on autoimmune retinopathy. Afterwards, we'll hear from Ashley Brundrett, one of our cornea fellows, about desmetorexis without endothelial keratoplasty uh, and other possible treatment options for corneal endothelial dysfunction. And then finally, we'll hear from one of our senior neurology residents who's been rotating through our neuro-ophthalmology rotation, Jonathan Galley. He'll talk to us about differential diagnosis for painful Horner syndrome. Thanks, Lynn. All right, I'm Lynn Hassman, the uveitis fellow. I'm, I'm going to talk, like Mike said, about autoimmune retinopathy. Um, so the story starts in 1976 when William Hoyt um, described three patients with blindness in the setting of, uh, of metastatic cancer. And he made an interesting observation. Uh, visual disturbances associated with cancer are ordinarily caused by metastasis to the brain, meninges, optic nerve, orbit, choroid, or retina. This report documents blindness caused by retinal de degeneration of obscure pathogenesis in three patients with cancer. So that kind of started the story. About a decade later, a 23 kilodalton protein um, uh, was discovered that um, the patients with cancer-associated retinopathy serum reacted to. And a few years later, it was um, revealed that that, pa that protein was recovering, a protein that is um, sometimes aberrantly expressed in cancer cells. Another decade later, um, this group showed that the patient's um, serum would react to the um, photoreceptor layer and that you could block that reaction with purified uh, recoverin, um, so indicating that that probably was the, the pathogenic antibody in this case. And then the, the group further showed that if you immunize a mouse with recombinant recoverin, you could get a photoreceptor disruption that was immune-mediated, so sort of a Cox postulate. Um, so fast forward to now, um, autoimmune retinopathy is comprised of perineoplastic retinopathy, so cancer-associated associated retinopathy is a spectrum of disorders um, that was sort of first described. Melanoma-associated retinopathy is a little bit of a different beast um, with some characteristic uh, antibodies that target more the bipolar cells and cause sort of a characteristic um, electronegative ERG. And then non-perineoplastic autoimmune retinopathy in cases which there's no um, associated cancer discovered. So I'm going to present a few case, uh, recent cases of non-perineoplastic autoimmune retinopathy. So the first is a 69-year-old man who's complaining of progressive difficulty with night driving. Um, so upon further questioning, he actually says he's noticing some tunnel vision, he's having problems with depth perception, and intermittent double vision. His past ocular history is significant for myopia, pseudophagia, and he's been treated for normal ten tension glaucoma for the last five or ten years uh, with Lumigan and laser trabeculoplasty. He's had a, um, he has coronary artery, artery disease and he's had a heart attack, also interstitial cystitis, but no other significant past medical history. On review systems, interestingly, he endorses some fatigue, a 30-pound unexplained weight loss over the last uh, three years, and tinnitus. It's a little concerning. Um, so on, on exam, his vision in the right eye is 2040, the left eye sees 2050. There's a very mild vitritis in both eyes. Um, and when you look at the fundus, you can see peripapillary atrophy and sort of a myopic appearance to the fundus. But the, arteri the, um, the vessels, particularly the arterioles, are attenuated in the 69-year-old, and the, the foveal reflex is sort of blunted. And the optic nerves are not extremely glaucomatous. Um, so his visual field, though, is um, notable for very severe constriction, and this is actually progressive compared to the information that he was referred with. Um, so his autofluorescence shows some hypoautofluorescence around the nerve, possibly just myopic, um, some other myopic changes, but then um, this dark hypoautofluorescence around the macula, and then actually a ring of hypoautofluorescence uh, right around the fovea. And his fluorescein um, sort of shows hyperfluorescence that's likely window defect around the macula and nasal, and then some changes around the nerve as well that may be myopic. 
The most striking um, feature of his imaging is this OCT in which if you look just um, beneath the fovea, you see that the photoreceptor layer, the um, ellipsoid zone, is intact, but then peripheral in the parafoveal area, it's gone, and the outer retina is also attenuated, and this is seen in both eyes, um, so probably causing that constriction of vision and his tunnel vision that he noticed. <clears throat> and his ERG is flat um, in um, scotopic and photopic parameters. So he got um, a basic workup in which we ruled out usual inflammatory suspects, um, and then actually ended up having um, anti-enolase, anti-retinal antibodies detected on both Western blot and immunohistochemistry. A little more about that later. So we presumed autoimmune retinopathy. The next step was to rule out malignancy in this patient with a 30-pound weight loss. Um, and his workup for malignancy was negative. He had um, chest and abdomen CT. He had a PET scan, cal um, CA-125, colonoscopy, uh, prostate serum antigen, uh, dermatology evaluation, and a bladder biopsy because he had, had a bladder mass, but there was no malignancy found. He was treated with prednisone, Celsept, and eventually required, required cyclosporin to stabilize his photoreceptor degeneration. The second case is a 47-year-old female with progressive blurring for two years. When pressed, she did endorse poor night vision, difficulty adjusting to changing in lighting conditions, and some contrast sensitivity issues. No significant past medical or ocular history. She had a family history of autoimmune thyroiditis. On review system, she also noted a 15-pound weight loss, some joint pain, chronic cough, and a little bit of gait unsteadiness. Uh, so this patient on exam, her vision in the right eye is 2020, the left eye is 2025. There's very trace vitritis in the left eye. If you compare the two eyes, uh, you can see that the vessels in the left eye are a little more attenuated. Maybe there's some mild blunting of the foveal reflex. The nerves. The rest of the um, exam is pretty normal. There was um, some hypopigmented spots kind of in the periphery. Um, on her OCT, the right eye looks pretty normal. Uh, and the left eye, you can see actually some macular edema. The photoreceptor layer here looks, in, looks fairly intact. Lost my screen here. Okay. Uh, fundus autofluorescence is not very remarkable. Some subtle changes here in the left uh, fovea that are probably related to the macular edema. And on fluorescein, um, you can see that the left eye, there's a little bit of disc staining and maybe some perivascular uh, leakage, but then there's just sort of this nasal hyperfluorescence, <clears throat> you know, in the a little bit later stages, which, which may just indicate a little bit of thinning and uh, window defect there. Her visual fields, though, are remarkable. The right eye is pretty full. The left eye is dramatically constricted. And then when we look at her ERG, she has um, pretty flat um, uh, scotopic responses and a really reduced B wave, especially in the left eye. And so she had also a workup. We included HLA-A29 for birdshot because she had a few spots and some ERG changes that could be consistent. She also got spark genetic testing looking for uh, any polymorphisms associated with uh, retinal degeneration, and that was all negative. Antiretinal antibodies, she actually had four. Um, only one of them is actually uh, associated with a known protein. And then she had some um, staining on in, in immunohistochemistry at the photoreceptor layer as well. So she was treated with Ozerdex, which res resolved her macular edema. Uh, she's getting, undergoing a malignancy workup in coordination with her PCP and starting methotrexate. So autoimmune retinopathy. Uh, the median age for patients with a cancer-associated retinopathy, and, and often this is or this can be the first presentation of, of a cancer, actually, is about 79. Patients with autoimmune retinopathy tend to be around 51. And then, interestingly, patients who present with macular edema can be younger, around age 36. There um, are more women than men aff affected, and the reports vary on what the frequency is. And there's often a family history of autoimmunity. So essential elements in the diagnosis of this disease. Number one, there cannot be any evidence of malignancy after a thorough workup. There can't be any evidence of a retinal degenerative condition. Uh, they have to have some anti-retinal antibodies. And there needs to be an ERG abnormality, plus or minus a visual field abnormality. Supportive criteria are symptomatic photopsias, scotomas, nyctalopia or photoaversion, and dyschromatopsias. 
Um, so how do we test for this? We, the screening western blots are used to um, basically probe, um, probe a, west, um, a blot created from human or porcine retinal lysates with human serum to detect any reactivity. Then the, this is validated with immunohistochemistry, so um, tissue sections of retina, either murine or por um, human or porcine, uh, with the same serum. And then it can also be validated with a western blot against a purified protein, like recoverin or enolase, um, or an ELISA against the same. So then how do we interpret this? So this is really where the field is um, struggling right now. <coughs> Um, so proteins targeted by antiretinal antibodies in CAR, or cancer-associated retinopathy, there's a handful that have been described. Some of them have been actually found to be expressed in tumors and shown either in vitro or in vivo, like the mouse um, photo that I showed you before, to be pathogenic, like recoverin, and many have not been. Similarly with um, MAR, or melanoma-associated melanoma retinopathy, um, these antibodies are are usually targeting bipolar cells, and we see an electronegative ERG, so they, they are probably pathogenic, we think. Um, and, but then in, in autoimmune retinopathy, there's an even longer list of, protein, or of antibodies that have been associated. Um, the pathophysiologic significance of those is not really known. <coughs> Very interestingly, though, if you look in some other um, patients with inflammation in their eye, you find antibodies against retinal antigens. So in onchocerciasis, no, greater than 90% of the patients that were looked at had an antibody against a 44 kilodalton uh, RPE protein. In toxoplasmosis, there's an antibody found in more than 90% of the patients against a photoreceptor protein. Um, patients with retinitis pigmentosa, particularly those with cystoid macular edema, in which there's breakdown of the blood retina barrier, have antiretinal antibodies, as do macular degeneration patients and other neurologic disease, autoimmune neurologic diseases lupus, and then 6 to 62 percent of normal people have antibodies as well. So um, how do we interpret this? So there's few, few of these antibodies with demonstrated uh, pathologic role, few with tumor expression that's known, many of unknown significance. And importantly, the presence of antiretinal antibodies might just be an indication that there's some inflammation going on in the eye. So you, you damage a portion of the eye, you release um, cells that are not normally exposed to the immune system, and the immune system recognizes those, um, those proteins and mounts an immune response. So it may be just a marker for some people of something pathologic going on in the eye. Um, so what else do we know about the pathophysiology? So the serum of these patients have uh, show elevated levels of TNF-alpha and interferon gamma, just sort of generic pro-inflammatory markers. But at levels much lower than um, other uveitides, like posterior uveitides that we think of. Similarly, much lower levels of IL-1 beta, which is a um, very upstream pro-inflammatory cytokine. And then um, fewer circulating plasmablasts, which are the antibody-producing cells in an acute reaction. Um, so whether or not these antibodies are pathogenic in every patient still definitely remains to be determined. And also notably, B cells are not the predominant circulating immune cell in either autoimmune retinopathy or other uveitis diseases. So that it may just be part of a global immune response. Um, so the most important thing, basically, to do for these patients, um, once we've identified them, is to rule out cancer. Um, as I said, cancer-associated retinopathy often um, pre presents before a known diagnosis of cancer. So this is coordinated with a primary care uh, physician. The patients need a chest, uh, a CT of the chest, ad abdomen, and pelvis. Maybe they need a PET scan as well. They you often get an MRI of the brain, a uh, Durham exam, colonoscopy, mammography when appropriate, and a gyne, gyne exam as well as a, when appropriate, prostate screening when appropriate. Um, and then they're treated usually first line with steroids, and then they almost always require something more, anometabolites, um, cyclosporin, Plasmapheresis and IVIG have been used, and it, that it makes intuitive sense if, you're, if you think that the antibodies are pathogenic. Um, rituximab and other immunomodul immunomodulatory therapies have been used as well. Um, and so if the disease is caught early, you can have some reversal of um, the photoreceptor damage and some um, improvement in vision. So what are the future directions in the, for this disease? First of all, validation of antiretinal antibody pathogenesis is a big, um, important move forward. Um, uh, 
both for diagno diagnostic purposes and for understanding the pathology of this disease. And then characterizing the immunogenetic predisposition of these patients. Why are these patients getting this disease? Why do some normal people have these um, antiretinal antibodies and don't suffer any vision loss? So some of this can be done with epidemiology, perhaps with the um, Utah population database, um, HLA haplotyping, NK cell receptor um, analysis, and even large-scale screens like genome-wide association studies. <coughs> Questions?